So what we're seeing here is that people don't like losses. Okay, that, that was not a really helpful statement in and of itself because even with the regular expected utility model, more money was still better than less money. So to some degree, regardless of what model, model you're looking at, people don't like losses. Like that's you know, a pretty consistent aspect of human behavior, I would say. But what we're showing with the two questions that we asked here is not only that people don't like losses, but that they, I guess, really don't like losses. And by really, I mean that they hate losses more than they like equivalent gains. So there's some bias in decision making that's being brought in when we make people think about things as losses rather than when we make people think about things as gains even when logically or rationally nothing's actually changed. And this is what, this asymmetry, the fact that people dislike losses more than they like games, gains, is what's actually causing this framing effect. And it's why people are changing their behavior. If they thought about losses and gains symmetrically, this wouldn't be happening. So if we're going to actually describe what people do rather than, you know, let's say what people should do or what that rational economic man, that Spock, would do, we need some sort of alternative to this expected utility model, right? So, you know, we think about, we already did the expected utility model. You know, that's this guy here. Got your levels of wealth. No that thing that we already saw. What prospect theory brings in is an alternative to this. So rather than a utility function, prospect theory says you have what's called a value function. They only did that because they didn't want to see use the same word because it would get confusing. So they said let's think about a value function here. And when we're looking at things that we would consider gains, the value function looks pretty much like the utility function. It's got the same shape. But notice here, just by thinking about, you know, our x-axis here is not defined as levels of wealth anymore. You know, here we see levels of wealth, here we see gains and losses. Prospect theory is assuming that people tend to think about their decisions in terms of gains and losses and think about those changes rather than, you know, automatically incorporating those changes into their overall level of wealth. And when you think about it, you know, did you really think about this as well? My net worth is $20,000. If I get $100 and it's $20,100, you can even think for yourselves, like, was that what you were doing explicitly or implicitly? The answer is usually no. So people are thinking in terms of gains and losses from some sort of what we would call a neutral reference point. And there's some ambiguity as to what forms that reference point, but nonetheless we seem to have, you know, whether it be a status quo, whether it be, you know, just where we consider our baseline is, we categorize things as whether we feel like it's a gain compared to that baseline or whether it's a loss compared to that baseline. The loss part of this is where the shape of the curve deviates. That rather than just continue this concave down shape, we instead model prospect theory via a value function that goes something like this. So this very basic S-shaped curve is probably one of the most cited things in all of economics, which is totally weird. Um, because basically every paper that talks about loss aversion, that talks about framing effects, etc., in their background section has to talk about this value function. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the diagram? Like, can you explain the two curves? So like... Uh, yes, I can. Can you be more so specific? Like, does it, what does it say? Because like, I understand this, I just don't quite understand what the, what the difference is here like between the two sides. Well, so you have an inflection point here that you don't have here, right? Right. Um, and we're, we're going to talk in a second in more detail, but for example, just to make sure this is clear to everybody, like say I were to give you an outcome where it's like 
I just give you five dollars. You're like, oh, that's a gain of five dollars. That puts me in my gains region and I get some, we'll say value from that plus five. If I were to say, all right, acclimate to wherever you are, get back to your you know, psychological neutral point, get back to your reference point. Okay, now I'm gonna take $5 from you. That brings us into the losses spectrum. Like we feel that as a loss. So you know, call this minus five. And then you're getting, again, some value from that. Call this V of minus five. But that value is negative, not surprisingly, in the same way that you'd have you know, negative utility from something that makes you unhappy, right? So that, of course, doesn't address the reason that it looks this way. But if you still have your question after the next slide, raise your hand and we'll go into more detail, okay? I just want to make sure everybody knew how to read this properly, okay? So we have some key features of this value function that like we said, we're looking at things in terms of gains and losses compared to where we feel our psychological status quo, our, our psychological neutral point is. You know, I've gotten acclimated to where I am. I consider this baseline, and then I'm comparing gains and losses against that baseline. We're not sure exactly how this reference point is created, and it could be created in different ways in different circumstances, and it could potentially be manipulated. So it's something worth talking about further, but nonetheless it seems like we have some sort of neutral point that we're judging gains and losses against. We notice here, you know, we talked about this S shape, that to some degree we're taking this as given in the same way that we are taking the concave down shape of the utility curve is given, right? That we're, that we're putting this out there as, here's a value function that seems consistent with a lot of human behavior. And so we're, you know, we're getting this S shape because there's literal, you know, if we were to think about this mathematically, I'm gonna give you an example as a discussion question eventually. Um, you'd, have to you'd have to describe this sort of piecewise because there's not necessarily one function that could describe the whole thing. Because not only is this part concave up and the, the gains part concave down, but this part's also steeper. So it usually is a situation where you have two different curves sort of stuck together at that reference point, because that's the thing that's actually describing the behavior that we're seeing. You can see in both cases, the marginal effects are decreasing, right? That the curve is getting flatter in magnitude in the gain spectrum as we go further out on the gains axis, and it's getting flatter. You know, if I were to extend this even more, you know, you'd have something that looks like that. Right? So we're getting, this, this value function is suggesting that we get desensitized to gains and losses as we go further out, which seems consistent with what you're saying in terms of empirical evidence, the empirical evidence that we see on the gain side is pretty consistent with this. When we look specifically at losses, and we're going to see this in a, in a few weeks, this shape implies, just think about the, the math, that we could say, would you prefer two losses to happen at the same time? And would you like to you know, integrate those two losses together? Or would you like to feel them individually? Meaning like you have one you know, bad thing happen to you here, you acclimate to your reference point and you have the next bad thing happen. The shape of this curve suggests that you'd wanna put them together, that you'd like want your grandma and your dog to die on the same day rather than separate days. It's a really morbid way of putting it, but that's like literally what that would mean, right? Um, when people are asked would you rather separate or put together those bad outcomes? People don't usually want to put them together. So they don't seem to be perfectly behaving in accordance with this shape in that way. And they're, not, they're basically saying, look, I'm not necessarily getting desensitized 
to bad things when bad things have just happened to me, which is what this would imply. Because you're like, oh, a bad thing happened. I'm here on the curve. Well, I'll just pile on another bad thing. It's not that much worse. <laughs> People, when asked explicitly, don't seem to want that. But the part that is consistent with this is that in a, in a slightly different context, even though it's, you know, at the end of the day, the same thing, just a slightly different, again, framing. When people are asked questions that would get at whether they're risk averse or risk loving in the realm of losses, they're usually risk loving. And the only way to explain that risk loving behavior in the realm of losses is to have something that's shaped like this. So, sort of. That you know, here seems pretty. You know, here seems pretty clear. We get weird things happening, as we would expect psychologically. We get some weird things happening when people are asked to think about losses, just because it's already something we don't like. We don't necessarily probably behave extra irrationally regarding losses. And I was actually, I was actually asking a question about this just a couple of months ago, and was told that in a lot of situations, because of the issue that I just described. Oftentimes people will take a very simple model that rather than having this S shape that they'll literally just make them lines. They just not even worry about the, the risk aversion or the risk loving part of it. And just say, make this two line segments, make this one twice as steep. And just, you know, abstract away from that issue entirely. Does that make sense? Makes the math easier too. But yeah, so the important part here is that you know, especially when this is first being considered, the, you know, the authors of this graph, the creators of this value function, made this S shape in order to explain why people seem to be risk seeking in the realm of losses. Because people, especially when you offer them something where there's some positive probability of not losing anything, people seem to like it. So here, this isn't always true, but the basic rule of thumb formulation is that the losses part of the spectrum is steeper than the gains part of the spectrum, and they're different by about a factor of two. And you can think about what this means. You know, just do a gain of x versus a loss of x. Notice we're noting these as just plus x minus x. So x itself is always positive. It's just the plus implies a, you know, indicates a gain and the minus indicates a loss. Given that this curve is steeper by a factor of two, we don't literally mean that like the like the marginal value is always off by two, because then you could aggregate that and you get it off by way more than a factor of two. So mathematically you would say the value of a loss of x would be at least approximately equal to negative two times the value of a gain of x. But that's just what that means. It doesn't actually specifically have to do with marginal values or this, you know, the instantaneous slope or anything like that. It's actually way simpler. Okay. So it's basically saying when people lose money, they feel worse than when people, like the magnitude of that is higher than the magnitude of you feel good of winning some money. Yeah. That's what we mean when we say they dislike losses. This gets back to exactly what we said in words here, right? They dislike losses more than they like equivalent gains. Our formulation in this graph is that they dislike losses more than they like gains by about a factor of two. So that's exactly the graphical interpretation of what we said in words, or the graphical manifestation of that concept. Okay. So what we actually see, the, the paper talks about two different specific effects that, you know, implicitly we've already thought about, just looking at the shape of this again, right? The first thing is the reflection effect. That just refers to the fact that the shape of this curve implies that we can flip people's preferences by flipping from gains to losses. So for example, and then that's just what we saw with our question, right? That if people were considering $500 for sure versus a gamble of zero or a thousand, you have a preference. 
if we're considering only the second stage of that question, all we did when switching the framing was we put negative signs on everything, right? The rather thinking about 500 versus zero or 1,000, you were thinking about negative 500 versus zero or negative 1,000. When taking all, you know, just putting those negative signs on everything, by and large, experimentally, we managed to flip people's preferences. So the reflection effect is just showing even though it doesn't necessarily make sense, we see this consistent finding that if we were to switch from a gain framing to an equivalent loss framing, we're flipping people's preferences, which is completely explained by the S-shaped nature of this, actually. The other thing that we're seeing is that people tend to be exhibiting what we're calling the isolation effect. Then that's just referring to this idea that we didn't incorporate the gains and losses into our overall level of wealth. We didn't even incorporate the two parts of the problem into one another. That, you know, even though I gave you on the same slide in the same couple of sentences, hey, here's this thousand dollars for sure, and now I'm giving you something else, or here this two th here's this two thousand dollars for sure, now I'm giving you something else. People by and large don't incorporate those things together. And not surprising because, again, if information processing and your brain power, if our information processing is not costless, we're going to engage in various things to make decision processes simpler, right? And in a lot of cases, you know, think about how you make a choice between, you know, like different phones. Like, well, I have a whole bunch of different phones to choose from, well, in a lot of ways they're pretty similar, let's focus on how they're different. That's something that in most contexts does pretty well for us as a decision-making strategy, <coughs> that we focus on the differences rather than the similarities. In this particular case, focusing on the differences rather than the similarities is part of what was causing that framing effect. Right? And so the isolation effect is referring to the, the observation that when posed with a complex problem, people tend to look at specifically the ways in which their choices differ and put to the side or to some degree ignore the ways in which their choices were the same. And in a particular context of these questions, the way the choices were the same is they bo in both cases, regardless of what you chose, you had that upfront amount of money and most of you probably ignored it. You're like, oh, I got that regardless of what I choose, I'm just gonna put that to the side. 